Our reading this evening is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 2, starting at verse 18. To the church in Thyatira, to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To those who are victorious and do my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations they will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. I will also give them the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a major debate going on in public life in Britain about what we can tolerate. In Glasgow University recently, there was a film about trans issues that was prevented from being shown three times um, by large demonstrations organised, I regret to say, with the help of my union, the UCU. Um, because it didn't accept the view, the film, that trans women are women. It was intolerable to the demonstrators that that view should be expressed. Catherine Stock, who's a professor of, who was a professor of philosophy at Sussex University, was driven out of her job by demonstrations following the publication of her book, Material Girls, in which she argued against the view that you could just self-ID your gender. So you could just declare yourself to be a man or a woman, depending on what you felt inside. The irony is, she's a lesbian. The government, as a result, has appointed a SAR for free speech in universities because it's so concerned about the issues. Or to take another area, in 2020, the Reader's Digest did a poll about immigration and refugees. 80% of British adults then believe that refugees come to this country because they think Britain's a soft touch. Two thirds think there are too many immigrants in Britain. Almost two thirds, 63%, think that there's too much done to help immigrants. And our current Prime Minister, it's important to say current because they seem to change quite often these days, um, has made it his priority to stop boats with refugees crossing the channel and his Home Secretary wants to send those claiming asylum to Rwanda. And ironically, they're both from immigrant families. What are the limits of tolerance? 
what do we not tolerate and what do we tolerate? And that's a major issue. And, and for us as Christians, traditional biblical Christian views are increasingly seen as intolerant in public life. The letter we're looking at tonight speaks very directly to these issues and calls us to the right kind of intolerance. Remember the way these letters are organised. You get an address to the church, then you get a characteristic of Jesus which has been drawn from the vision of him in chapter 1. Then you get a commendation. I know these good things about you. Then you get a confrontation. Nevertheless, however... I'm concerned about this. A call from Christ to turn back, a call to listen well, and an encouragement. So let's walk through this letter, looking at those things. First of all, there's the address. The letter sent to the angel of the church in Thyatira. Thyatira, in the modern world, is Achisa. Um, here it is. It's about 42 miles in land from the Aegean Sea between Turkey and Greece. And it's relatively unimportant compared to other places in the region. This one only has about 25,000 people as its population. So it's just it's much, much smaller than Ephesus, 300,000, or Pergamum, 100,000. It's much, much smaller as a place. And um, it's well known particularly for the trade guilds, we found lots of inscriptions in stone from that period. And the archaeologists tell us there were clothiers, there were bakers, there were coppersmiths, there were linen weavers, there were tanners, there were potters, all named in inscriptions. And there was dyeing. Um, that's making things colourful, not the other sort. <laughs> um, there was dying. Think of Lydia in Philippi in Acts chapter 16. She's the woman who sells purple cloth. And Acts says she came from Thyatira. Um, there were also sports clubs for young men. Um, athletic clubs. This is sounding more and more, more like Loughborough the more I say about it, isn't it? Um, and those trade guilds were particularly important. Because they were known for three things. They were known for, first of all, their religious basis. If you had um, a, a, a trade guild, you would have a patron god or goddess who looked after your guild. And in many, many of them in the town of Thyatira had um, Apollos Tyrimnius, who was the prime god of the whole city. Secondly, the trade guilds were known for their banquets bit like trade guilds today, really, um, where they get together every so often and eat food and drink together and talk together. And the food they were offered had usually been offered beforehand to their patron god by prayers being prayed over it. And often, because these banquets were mainly for men, you'd have prostitutes available as post-dinner entertainment. Thirdly, the trade guilds were the basis of social recognition and progress. If you wanted to get ahead, you joined the guild for the trade that you worked in. Now that's why so much there is so much social pressure on the Christians in Thyatira that we'll see in a few moments. Let's do that a characteristic of characteristics of Jesus in verse 18. And these are really striking. His eyes are like blazing fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze. The blazing fire image is about being perceptive. He sees into people's hearts and minds. And the blazing fire connects with the burnished bronze feet, because the coppersmiths in Thyatira made a particularly good form of bronze which is an amalgam, an alloy, of copper and zinc. And it's significantly stronger than either metal alone. And they were known for that in Thyatira. So this is an image of solidity, stability, strength. But you need fire to make 
this alloy. So these are Thyatira images. And Jesus commends them in verse 19. They, these are growing disciples. They're the kind of people Ali was talking about this morning in encouraging us to be growing disciples. Jesus commends their deeds, their love, and their loyalty, their faith. He commends their service and the per their perseverance. And he commends the fact they're doing more than they did when they were first believers in Jesus. This is an attractive church, the church in Thyatira. And we know the city grew by the 2nd and 3rd century AD. It had, the town had grown dramatically. And as the town grew, the church grew. Loughborough. Loughborough has grown four times in 20 years in some from 15,000 to about 60,000 by the So what's wrong? That takes us to the confrontation. And that takes up the majority of the letter. Does this woman justify? Who justifies? No, this is almost certainly not the woman's real name. But stands for a woman who's losing the belief of the spell. But it's an echo of the Elijah story from your time. Jezebel was the queen of the house. And she was a stone who worshipped um, the god Baal and the god Asherah, who was Baal's consort, a female counterpart. And under her influence, I have set up a, ten, a temple for Baal, with an altar going to that big gift for that god, and he set up a sacred pole, which was called an Asherah. Jezebel arranged to have all the prophets of the Lord killed even though some of them got hidden in a cave, you can say. And Elijah, you, you remember, confronted those prophets, 450 of them, on Mount Carmel in the story of 1913. So eventually, Elijah prayed over a sacrifice, and fire came from heaven and consumed them. But Jezebel's influence continued. She had a son called Joram, who followed Ahab as the king of Israel. And when he was eventually killed by Jehu, Jehu said to him, how can there be peace as long as all the idolatry and witchcraft of your mother Jezebel abound? The word for idolatry is actually all the prostitutions of witchcraft of your mother abound. So to call somebody Jezebel, as Jesus does of this person here, is raising a crucial issue of infidelity. She led the people of God away from God. And this Jezebel in Thyatira, in verse 20, claims to be a prophet. That is, she's claiming to speak directly from God to the church in that city. And she, she teaches... Her teaching is what's wrong, because she misleads her, my servants. Now, she's not teaching anything about Jesus. She's not teaching anything about God. If you listen to her teaching, it would have sounded thoroughly, thoroughly orthodox. But, her false teaching is about behaviour. Now, just along the way, notice there's no criticism that they're listening to a female teacher. The fact she's female is neither here nor there. It's what she says, not who she is, that's significant. And her false teaching is about how you live. It's, a co it's about compromise. It's compromising the way you live. You see, compromise isn't choosing to worship other gods instead of Jesus. It's about trying to include other gods along with our worship of Jesus. That's what compromise is about. And compromise works by a series of just gradual stages. It starts with attraction. Something gets your attention. 
and you think, oh, that looks interesting, that looks something I'd like to do. Satan is really, really good at his job. He will make sin look attractive. He will make acting in an evil way look like something you'd like to do. Stage two is then rationalisation. We find reasons why we think it will be all right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it will be fine. I'm sure it will be all right. And it's only one occasion. It doesn't really matter. And then thirdly, we move on to indulgence. As we do it more and more and more, our conscience becomes less sensitive. And we become more sure. It's fine to do this. It's really not a problem. And we end up then with redefinition. We redefine what's wrong so that we're now deciding what's right and wrong. And we, we say, oh, I don't need to feel guilty about that. It's not something God's really interested in. So what are the compromises Jezebel's teaching? Sexual immorality and eating food offered to idols. Sexual immorality is saying it doesn't matter what you do with your body. And it may also go with infidelity to Jesus. Because as we saw back in the Elijah story, immorality can be a metaphor for worshipping other gods and drifting away from God. But given that the trade guilds provided prostitutes at their parties, I suspect this is just straightforward. Um, sex, inappropriate sex. Eating food offered to idols. That says, well, it really doesn't matter. All gods are basically the same. So if your trade has a patron god that you, you want to offer, you want to eat food offered to, that's okay, don't worry about it. She was encouraging believers not to worry about compromising. It was fine, provided Jesus was in your heart and in your mind. Your behaviour really didn't matter. Now there's a really interesting echo of Acts chapter 15 here. In Acts 15, the believers meet in Jerusalem to decide the terms on which Gentile believers, believers who are not Jewish, can be part of the church with, Christian, with, with Jewish believers. And this is part of their letter. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us um, not to impose any other burden on you except, and then they list four things, Food sacrifice to idols, sexual immorality. Now just look at verse 24. I will not impose any other burden on you. Word for word from the Acts letter. Sexual immorality and offering food to idols, yep, they're there too. So it looks as though the issues that were around in the late 40s AD was still around in the 90s AD when Revelation's written. But in the 40s, they were over in the eastern part of what we now call Turkey. In the 90s, we're now over in the western part of Turkey. But those issues are still around. And the central issue is about tolerating false teaching and, and compromising. The question the compromisers put is, do you think it really matters if you give a little over this? Why, why not have sex with that other person who isn't your husband or wife? Why don't you get drunk at the office party? Why don't you use foul language? Doesn't that mean that your friends, your colleagues, your fellow students will see that you just like them and that being a Christian doesn't mean being different? It will make it easier for them to become followers of Jesus, won't it? No, it won't. Look at how Jesus responds. First, in verse 21, even Jezebel, he gives time to repent of her immorality. He gives her chance to change. Even the Jezebels of this world, who are the false teachers, he gives them opportunity to change and turn back to him. He offers them judgment if they don't. I'm going to cast her on a bed of suffering. Some people think God ought not to judge people. 
But imagine God didn't judge people. That would mean that ultimately nothing you do really matters because God doesn't care. Without judgment, ultimately, there's no difference between Adolf Hitler and Mother Teresa because it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter if there's no God. Is that the kind of universe you really believe in, folks? No, of course it's not. So the first part of Jesus' response is to offer her chance to change and then if she won't change, she faces suffering. Our TNIV has translated verse 22, um, I will cast her on a bed of suffering. Actually, the original just says a bed. And I think it's a play on two ideas. A bed is where you have sex. But a bed is where you go when you're sick. And I think it's playing on those two ideas. If she's, not, if, if she's prepared to use the bed wrongly by having sex with other people who she shouldn't be, then she's going to be on the bed because she'll be ill. If people choose to reject Jesus, he's not going to compel them. He leaves them to go their own way. There's a devastating expression three times in Romans 1 where Paul's describing the pagan world. He says, God gave them up. What God does when people walk away from him is let them walk away. And they suffer the consequences of walking away from him. Worship of idols, sexual immorality, sinful desires, depraved minds, full of evil thoughts and misguided plans. What about Jezebel's followers? Jesus speaks to them too. In verse 20, he, he speaks to um, my servants who've been misled into sexual immorality and food sacrifice to idols. There were people in the church strongly influenced by her. And again, Jesus offers them a chance to change. I will make those who suffer, commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of their sins. Jesus offers them a chance to change. Jesus offers them a way out. If, if you accept her teaching, turn back, says Jesus. Turn away from it. Now, are you in a Jezebel position? Are there parts of your life where you're living in ways that deny the gospel. Here's the good news. That's not the end of the story. That's not the end of the story. If Jesus is putting his finger on something in your life where you're compromising, where you're sinning, where you're failing to be the person he wants you to be, he offers you a way back. Turn back. Turn back to him. If they repent of her ways, he says. But if they won't, I'm going to strike her children dead. Now, he's not here, I think, thinking of spirit, literal death. I think he's thinking of spiritual death, of being separated from God. Jesus' burning eyes see through all our excuses, don't they? In Jeremiah, there's an echo here of Jeremiah 17.10. I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward everyone according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Now, the original in Jeremiah is, I search the heart and examine the kidneys, which sounds a bit strange to us, doesn't it? But remember, the heart, for ancient people, is the place of the will and the decision-making. And the kidneys are part of your guts. That's where your emotions are. So your, your bowels and your kidneys and those lower bits of your body are where your emotions come from. Um, we, we say that a bit, don't we? We talk about, oh, I've got a gut feeling about that. And we're using that metaphor. So everything, we, we think that the mind is up here, don't we? So just move everything down a level and you've got the way ancient people think. And that's exactly the language that Revelation uses 
when Jesus speaks in verse 24. I am he who searches hearts and minds. I am he who searches kidneys and hearts. This is the original. Which of those is leading you astray? Is it your kidneys? Is it your emotions, your feelings? Are you being drawn away from Christ by feelings? Or is it your, your, your heart? Is it your decision making? Are your thoughts and your plans leading you away from Christ? Which of those is it? Because God offers a way back. He's not wanting to throw people out. When Christ puts his finger on something in our lives, he's doing it because he wants us to come back to him and to change. He's not doing it to make us feel bad. The devil's approach is to make us feel generally guilty. The Lord's approach is to put his finger on something quite specific so he can help us change. So then we get the encouragement. And this is beautiful. Um, he warns them about Satan's deep secrets in verse 24, which seem to be magic. And, and in Revelation 21.8 and 22.15, sorcerers, those who engage in magic, sexually immoral people and idolaters are among those who will suffer the second death, which is separation from God. Ephesus, just up the road, was a major center of magic. Um, we know that from inscriptions and documents we found there. And it's likely that way of operating was around in Thyatira too. You, you'd find a formula, a spell, that would allow you to control the spirits to do what you wanted, which, of course, is the very opposite of the Christian faith, where we pray so that God can control us to do what he wants. And then you get the encouragement to hold on to what you have in verse 25. Stick on to the things that you learn, verse 19. These lovely things that are going on in your life, stick with them. And Jesus' promise is not just that you'll be victorious, as in other letters, but it's tied to obedience. Verse 26, those who are victorious and do my will to the end, I will give authority over their nation. They will rule them with an iron scepter and dash them to pieces like pottery. This is Psalm 2 verse 9 that he's quoting. But shattering pottery would ring bells in Thyatira where the potters had a guild. And he's, he's saying you can share my authority by speaking and living the gospel message. Then you can bring other people under my authority too. And I'll give you the morning star. Now that's not the communist newspaper. It's an image that's used, we still talk about Venus, the planet Venus as the morning star, don't we? Um, and Venus was understood as the morning star and was worshipped as a god. Roman emperors claimed they were descended from Venus, the morning star. But in chapter 22, verse 16, Christ is called the bright morning star. So when Christ says, I will give you the morning star, he's saying, I'll give you myself. You'll know me, you'll engage with me, you'll love me, and I'll love you. That You'll know the reality of this. If you're, if you're prepared to be victorious, so then we finish up with the call to listen carefully. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Pay careful attention, says Jesus. This stuff really matters. God is bothered about the way you live. It's not all just Jesus in my heart. It's Jesus in my life. Where do you need to pay attention? Where are the areas of sin in your life or your family's life where the Spirit is shining a light to lead you to repent and to turn back to Jesus? Remember, the Lord shows us our sin not to condemn us, but to free us. 
where's the where are the areas where the Lord's calling you to hold on to what you already have and not go backwards? Where do we as a church need to pay attention to this letter? Are there areas where we as a church are allowing false thinking, false living to become part of what we hear by those who claim I'm speaking prophetically? There are people in the Church of England at the moment who claim they're speaking prophetically about all sorts of things. And we need to weigh what they're saying with considerable considerable care so let's pause for a minute and reflect personally on what we've seen here Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you didn't compromise, but you went all the way on the journey to the cross. And through the cross to resurrection and ascension to your rightful place in heaven, because you kept on the path that your Father set for you. Give us grace that we too might be victorious and do your will to the end. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear where your flaming fiery eyes are lighting up areas of our lives that you want to help us change in Jesus name Amen